Amen. God is so good. It's, it's good to see you all this evening, and thanks for coming out. And it's nice to be a family and a team. Um, you know, we're really here because we want to be a beacon. We want to be a lighthouse. We want our lives. I, I was going to say this place, but it's not about a place. It's, we want our lives together to be a radiant, shining light for Johannesburg and beyond and just where God can be made visible and his life can be, can be um, experienced. And so it doesn't matter what the, what the need or what the, where we're at, God is right there to, to come alongside and just to, to, to meet that need and to walk with him. You know, I was reading in uh, Galatians 2.20, I mean, we all probably know this verse, where the Apostle Paul said, it is no longer I who live, I'm crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave his life for me. So did you ever notice there that it is no longer I who, we are not just sons of God, but we are to live the life of the Son of God. So we're, we're not just sons, and the daughters here included, but we, we, it says, it is no longer I who live, Paul said, but Christ. So we are to live the life of the Son of God by living his life. And that takes, you know, in Ephesians 4, it talks about growing up into the fullness of Christ. And that's not just uh, one aspect of him, but all that we see in Jesus, all that his life exuded to people in every way that he interacted with people in everything that he demonstrated he operated from a point of fullness and we are to grow up into his fullness and so part of that has to do with our relationship with God and our walking with him and hearing from him and so uh, we're going to have Amanda come and share on the topic of you know um, that hearing from God and, and everything I'll let her get into this but so um, I was going to say something else what was I going to say um, oh, I just wanted to say, sometimes we have a song or a couple songs. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places, right? Is that future or present tense? Present tense. So you and I, were seated with Christ in heavenly places, correct? All right. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, Paul said, the Apostle Paul. So... There is this aspect. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places. And so um, now we are to live that out and to walk that out. And sometimes you may feel like, well, um, sorry, did you do that yet? Or go ahead. You can go ahead. We're just talking here. Uh, the, the offering basket is going to come around um, if you want to do that. So the, um, we are seated in Christ. But there is also an aspect of growing up into him in all things. So while we are, uh, our life is hid in Christ in God, that's a done deal. It's not something we need to strive to do. In the same time, we are growing up into him in all things. So we need to recognize the position, what we call the positional aspect, which is it's done, it's finished, our life is hid in Christ, and everything is available. All his life is available to us. Our part is to simply believe and to walk and live that out. And there is this other aspect of we're not where we want to be yet, experientially. What I mean by that is that does our life perfectly reflect the fullness of Christ, the effectiveness of Christ in all areas? So that is called the experiential aspect. So positionally, we are in Christ. Experientially, we're growing up into him in all things. So, you know, sometimes, you know, when a song says, you know, I'm far from that, it's talking about we're growing up into him. But we have full access right now. So I just wanted to touch on that. So because, you know, we need to be, in Ephesians, Paul said, um, that uh, he prayed for others that their eyes may be enlightened to know 
the fullness of what God has for us. So it's all about our eyes and, and the, of our understanding being enlightened. But we have everything in Christ, but we're, in, we're busy growing up into him in all things. So Amanda, I'm not going <laughs> to continue on, don't worry. So you come up and share. So everybody loves Amanda. Amanda is a very uh, important part of our team here. We love you, and so we're looking forward to what you have to share with us. Guys, if you looked at the height of the podium when you got here, you could have told that Paul wasn't going to speak today. It was going to be somebody way shorter. Um, I'm very excited to be sharing with you on the topic of hearing God's voice. Um, and God himself has actually labeled um, my message today. And he calls it, hear God, feel God, and having Gnosko with God. <coughs> um, last week I had this dream. God gave me a dream. And in the dream, he said to me, I want you to teach my people how to hear me, feel me, and have gnosko with me. Now, gnosko is a Greek word that God taught me a long time ago, so it was quite amazing when he reminded me of that word. Um, and what it actually means is to walk intimately, to know intimately. Now, a lot of people know of God, and a lot of people know about God, but how many of us are act actually walking intimately and knowing him, like really knowing him? And what God was showing me was that it was always his intention from the beginning of time for him to walk intimately and closely with us. So I want you to go with me to Genesis. Um, that's in the Old Testament, in the beginning of the Bible. For those of you that don't know. Um, and we're going to Genesis 3, verse 8. It reads, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Okay, so look closely at that, and you can see that they say they heard the sound of the Lord God. So what they're talking about there is they heard his footsteps. Now, for you to actually hear somebody's footsteps, they need to be walking right next to you. So it wasn't like God was a distant voice talking from another place and just giving them guidance and direction. He's walking very closely with them. And, and as you know, Adam and Eve kind of messed it up for us. But God found a new way to speak to us through Christ. And then when Christ had to return to God, God sent the Holy Spirit to each of us to speak to us. So we still have access to that. We still have access to um, walking intimately with God. And most Christians these days think that God doesn't want to walk with us like he walked with us in the Old Testament. And the reason is they're actually expecting to hear God's audible voice. And unfortunately, this only happens to very few people to be able to hear God's audible voice. But I can guarantee you that each and every one of you has actually heard God's voice before. Who believes me? Who doesn't believe me that you haven't heard God's voice? Okay, so when you go back, let's go back to the first time that you were actually saved. When you, when you were listening to the message and you felt a conviction in your heart and something said to you, you know what, this, you need to change your life around. You need to move in a new direction. What you're doing, you really need to change this. That was the Holy Spirit speaking to you right then. That was conviction. That little voice that you heard was actually the Holy Spirit. It was, the, it was what the Bible calls a still small voice. So God has spoken to you before, and he wants to speak to you more and more every day. Um, in 1 John 6, 6, 5, it says, No man can come to the Father unless he or she is drawn to him by Christ through the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what that scripture is talking about. To first go to God, we have to come through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. That encounter that you had when you were first saved uh, and you gave your life to Jesus, that was the Holy Spirit calling you. Okay, so now there, there are many ways that God speaks to us. I'm just going to touch and highlight on the five most common ways. I'm not going to get into uh, God speaking through us to his word because I know that all of you know how God speaks to us through his word, okay? And God's word cannot be substituted for any other way that God speaks to us, whether it's a prophecy, whether it's through conscience. We always have to, like, I can explain it like God's word, his Bible, his written word, it serves as a foundation to compare and to line up every other way we hear God. So we can know that this is the truth of what God is saying. So the five ways I'm going to touch on, uh, actually, um, God speaks to the conscience of a person. 
He speaks to the inner spirit of a person. He speaks by using others' wise counsel, and he speaks with vocal gifts of the spirit. The vocal gifts refer to um, tongues, interpreting of tongues, and prophecy. And then the last one is going to be dreams and visions. But before we discuss the question, I know all of you are, have this question going through your mind. How do I know which is my voice and which is God's voice? Okay. Um, and John 10, 27 says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And now I've asked God, why, why do you use the word sheep and not lamb? And God said to me, sheep shows maturity. Sheep are, uh, and lamb is, lamb are babies, so they're immature. And for my sheep to hear my voice, they need to be spiritually mature. So he's not talking about maturity in age, because you can be young, but you can have spiritual wisdom, okay? And um, um, unless, we, unless we actually die to our sinful nature and die to ourselves and our fleshly desires, we come to a point then where we can actually develop, uh, develop spiritually and begin to hear God's voice. Otherwise, if we haven't died to ourselves, then it's just stunting hearing from God. So we need to get to that place. And to, need to, to know God's voice, we need to know his character, we need to know, and we need to know his heart. And we do this by spending time in the scripture and just going through what is God's character, what is God's heart, and really getting to know him through the, skip, through the scripture. And then it becomes real to us, and then we start to see it in our daily lives. So I just want to give you an, a silly example of how to discern between God's voice and your voice, okay? So just say, you know how a child knows his father's voice. He knows his father's voice because he knows his nature, knows his character, and he knows what his dad represents. So if you're a little child playing in a room, you're taking your toys, you're throwing them all over the place, you're stomping on them, going a bit crazy, daddy comes in, is daddy going to say to you, well, guys, you know, well, well, my son, you know what? Just go on, you're having fun, just have a ball, smash your toys, throw it around, I'm going to love you anyway. Does that sound like God? Does that sound like your father? No, because God is a God of order. He's a God of structure. He gives love, but he expects obedience. So right then, you will know, this is not my father's voice. I'll give you another silly example what actually happened to me. So picture this. You're walking down the street, and there's a beggar, and you've been craving chocolate cake the whole day, and you have your last 20 bucks. You're on your way to the shop to get it. And you're thinking, you know, I worked so hard. I got this tip. It came at the right time. This is God. I'm so excited. I'm going to have this chocolate cake. And something in you, an unction, just says, well, you know what? Give it to the beggar. And then you kind of, okay, this part wasn't me. I'm just exaggerating now. Um, you kind of talk yourself out of it. And you say, well, Jeremiah 29, 29 11, And you actually use scripture. And you say, you know what? God's intention is for hope and a future for everyone. So God's going to give this high guy hope. He's going to help this beggar. And everybody makes choices. He didn't make the right choices. I'm going to get my cake. Do you think that's God? Even though that 20 rand came at the right time, that's not God. Because God is saying, use your last to bless somebody else. And God loves a cheerful giver. So that voice that you're not hearing, even though it might sound like your voice and you might use scripture to defend it, it's not your voice. And you can discern that from really knowing your father's voice, from intimacy with him and knowing God's character. Um, the next point I want to go to is God speaks through our conscience. Um, God can often speak through our conscience, but I just want to I, I wanna, um, point this out, that you can't really rely on your conscience alone because everybody has a different conscience. My conscience could be different to yours. And the things, and our conscience can actually deceive us because people's con uh, consciences are influenced by their daily lives, what they go through, their upbringing, uh, the teaching that they've been taught, uh, and their moral beliefs. So if you think that God is speaking to you through your conscience, which sometimes he does, you need to go to the word of God, align it with the, with the word of God, and see, is this true? Is this really God speaking to me? Um, and again, I'm going to use I'm going to use silly examples. And sometimes, I mean, these examples uh, examples really happen. So, picture this man, and he goes up to this woman, and he says to her, "Wow, you look so beautiful. I've been watching you, you know, and I've fallen in love with you over the last years. And I really feel uh, in my heart that you were meant to be my wife. And you know, I have peace in my conscience." 
And this woman is married. The man knows he's married. She's got three kids. And he's like, well, I really feel it in my conscience and I have peace. Do you see what I mean? Is that, is that God, go to the Bible. Let's take that example. Even though he feels so strongly about it, he feels like God has set this woman before him. Let's go to the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about it. The Bible says, do not covet your neighbor or your neighbor's wife for that matter. So how could this actually be God speaking to him? So every, every time we hear God through a different channel, we need to take it to the Word of God, and we need to see, what does God say about this in the Bible? And then we'll know. And, and slowly, as we start to do this, we will start to learn our Father's nature and His character. Um, when God speaks to our conscience, it's usually to convict us of something. Um, and he convicts us so that we can change our lifestyle, so we can see what's sinful in our life and we can move away from us. God never wants to condemn us because condemnation brings guilt, but conviction brings repentance. And to repent means to literally walk away and to change your life around. If you go to John 8, 9, 11, it says, Jesus said to the woman in the court, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? Jesus answered, no one, she answered, no one, Lord. Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go on your way, and from now on, sin no more. So can you see, God did not condemn her. Jesus did not condemn her. He convicted her. And from doing that, she repented and she changed her ways. So when our ear is sensitive to the voice of conviction, then it becomes very, very easy for God to keep us out of trouble. And um, being, sensitive, being sensitive to the voice of conviction is something that we need to, we need to really spend time learning about. I want to give you a, a real example. I'm just going to have a sip of my water first. When I, <coughs> when I first met my husband, before he was my husband. Um, this was a few years ago. I'm sorry, my throat's <coughs> um, He was working at this job, and he was very miserable. He wasn't happy in that position, and he decided, well, you know what? I'm actually going to just leave this job. I'm going to trust God f um, in, in faith to find me something new and something better. So i got to tell you, when I heard that, I thought, hmm, this one, I really don't think he's going to be my husband because he's kind of lacking on the wisdom side. You know, he wants to quit his job. He doesn't have another job. doesn't really make sense. But like later on, as the story progresses, you'll see I actually fell in love with his beautiful conscience, believe it or not. Um, so he left his job. He... He was staying at home and he was just trusting God and praying for a miracle, something supernatural to happen so that he can get into a new position. And at the end of that month, what happened was the company that he just left had accidentally deposited his full salary into his account. So I was expecting to say, woohoo, here's my miracle. It's supernatural. This has to be God. And I'm just going to enjoy this. So I just sat back to watch this whole thing play out. And what he did was he phoned that old company and he said to them, listen, guys, um, I've left already. Your payroll has, has accidentally put money into my bank account. And unfortunately, I don't have a new job yet. So I'm going to have to pay it back to you only when I find a new job. And you're just going to pay it back slowly. And then um, we continued to pray. It was very needless to say. I thought that was very cute. And then about a month or two later, uh, he got offered this job from a big auditing company, and um, he started to pay off that debt. So when you go back and you look at the situation, it's so easy to say, well, that must have been my blessing when they accidentally paid it into my salary because I prayed for it. It was supernatural. What are the chances of this actually happening? But if you line up with the word of God, what does it say? He would actually be robbing that old company by taking that money because it wasn't due to him. So we have to, vet, we have to tread very lightly because the devil tries to come into these situations. And you know what? The devil is not a smart guy. He's actually just a pretender and a manipulator. I mean, when you, when you think about it, even when he uh, tempted Jesus, he used the word of the Bible. He used the scripture to say, well, why don't you just jump? Surely you'll be saved. In the same way, it's like, why don't you take the money? God laid it before you. So it's, it's, it's very important to know the character of God. And I'm going to keep going back to that, to the character and having intimacy with God. Um, <clears throat> the next way that God speaks to us is through the inner spirit of a person. 
the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit speaks to believer within the spirit, and sometimes you get the strong feeling, and some people call it their gut instinct, some people call it their intuition. And so let me give you an example. Sometimes you walk into a place and you, everything looks fine, but there's this unction in you, like this place is not safe. I mean, everybody seems fine, but you just feel there's something just not kosher in this place and you feel the need to get out. And what that is, it's the Holy Spirit speaking to your spirit to warn you, get out of here. There's something about to happen. It's not safe. So we need to, we need to know that voice so we can trust that voice. And God can use that voice to save us from situations that we don't really need to be in in our daily life with God. And God reveals things through our inner spirit. Usually it's things that are not noticeable with the natural eye, but it would require a spiritual understanding of it. So things that you can't just see in a, in a, in a, during the course of the day. If we go to 1 Corinthians 2.11, For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So what it's saying is God has given us the spirit so that he can communicate with us and, he can, and we can discern the spiritual things. Paul uses the term inner man many times in his epistles. In Romans 7, 22, 23, he says, I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So the inner man is referring to the spiritual aspect of a man, and the outer man is the visible external aspect. When we accept salvation to Christ, our bodies now, as soon as we do this, our bodies become the temple of the Holy Spirit. But our minds need to be renewed to Christ's mind so that God can speak to the inner man. If we don't have the character to, carry to, to, to actually carry the gift, if we don't have the character to carry the gift, then God can't trust us wholeheartedly and tell us what he wants to tell us. So he needs to trust our character. So sometimes the gift will be there for you. He, there's these promises that are there for you, but you go through this process of refining and purification so that you can come to a point of where your mind is renewed and your character reflects Christ's character. And when that starts to happen, that's when you start seeing his Shekinah glory in your life. In John 4.24, it reads, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So God is really, really interested and concerned about our spirit because our spirit is the way that he can communicate with us, so he, he, he doesn't take this lightly. And sometimes you'll find, we've, we've read in the Bible on one occasion, that God speaks in a still, small voice. And I find in my life, mostly, it's through a still, small voice, which is that inner voice, the inner man. And in 1 Kings 19, verse 11, 13, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. I'm just going to tell you what happened there. Um, it was when Elijah escaped from Jezebel. He hides in the cave, and then God's revelation, it uses the word, came to him. Okay? Um, and Elijah was complaining about God's prophets being killed, and he was the only one who survived. God instructed Elijah at that point to go stand on the mountain in God's presence. And Lord sends a mighty wind, which breaks the rocks into pieces. But... But the Lord was not in the wind. Then he sends an earthquake and a fire, but the Lord was not there either. After all that, the Lord spoke to Elijah in a still, small voice. You could call it a gentle whisper. So why do you think God spoke to Elijah in a still, small voice? He had the opportunity to speak in an earthquake, in the fire. That would have been so awesome. Why didn't he? Why did he just speak slowly in a soft little voice afterwards? It was because God wanted to teach Elijah that... Every time, when, when God is at work and when the work, of, when the work of God is happening, it doesn't always have to be accompanied by a dramatic revelation or, or manifestation. He was teaching Elijah how to hear the different ways he could speak in. If we go to Zechariah 4, 6, it tells us that God's work is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. And I believe that this means that overt displays of power are not necessary for God to get the work done. He can get it done with his spirit. And sometimes God speaks to the inner man for our own benefit. Sometimes he speaks for others' benefits and sometimes both. So um, when God was talking to me 
about this today, he reminded me of this uh, funny story. Well, not funny, but it was unusual then when I just started walking with God. And it was, it was everything in one. God speaking through my conscience, through visions, and it was just um, amazing how that happened. So what had, had, had actually happened was I was at, an, at another church, and there was a young boy that I had met. And this boy, I didn't really know him well. I met him for, I knew him for about two weeks. And he said to me, listen, I'm, I'm looking for a new job, and, uh, and do you think you can pray with me? And I said, okay, sure. So we decided at a certain time we'd get before the presence of the Lord, him at his house, me at my house, and let's just pray and see what the Lord wants to say. And as I was praying, I saw that there were lots of cars, that God wants to give him a job with cars. And, um, and then God said to me, he, there's something with his license. He doesn't have his license. So I asked him, and he said, well, you know, I started lessons, but um, then I lost my job, so I couldn't carry on with the lessons. So God's showing me cars and lessons. And then God says to me, Amanda, I want you to pay his debt. It's 1,700 rand to this boy that I just met only knew his name. So I'm like, immediately, I'm like, devil, get behind me. This must be the devil, because I've only got 300 rand in my bank account. God wants 1,700 rand. God can do mathematics. This is definitely not God. And the next day, the very, very next day, this is God. God has a good sense of humor. Um, a friend of a friend of mine phoned me. I remember I was driving home, and God said to me, um, you know, God, God actually talks to me a lot while I'm driving, while I'm in the kitchen, and, and I'm thinking about now while I'm in the shower. You know, I see, I see that you, this, these people here are smiling when I say kitchen because they're like, what do you mean God talks to you in the kitchen? You're hardly ever in the kitchen. Your husband's always in the kitchen. Well, let me tell you guys, when you come to the live team meeting, yes, he does prepare those cute little salmon snacks, but most of the time, it's me in the kitchen. Somebody needs to go to the kitchen where the microwave is, warm up the food that he's prepared, and the chocolate cake is usually in the kitchen in the fridge. So let's be fair, God speaks to me in the kitchen as well. But this time he was speaking to me while I was driving. And he said to me, um, so somebody had called me and said, listen, please can you do my hair, a friend of a friend, and I can't make it to work, you've got to do it at your house, I need this, this, and this. And I worked it out for it, and not, not knowing, I said, well, if I do the calculations, it's going to work it to 1,700 rand. And as soon as I said that, I said, oh, God, that's you. I know that's you, because that guy, debt was 1,700 rand. So all the way home, I'm saying to God, you know, I really wanted those nice winter boots. It's these ones, guys, but I never bought it at that stage. And I said, I really wanted those nice winter boots, and now you're going to make me take my 1,700 rand that hasn't even come into me yet and give it to this guy that I don't know. And God said, yes. So I obeyed. I phoned the driving instructor. I, f I, I sneakishly found out what driving school it was. I phoned the driving instructor, and I said, listen, um, this is what happened. I don't, know, don't really know this guy, but God said to me, you need to pay his debt, so can you pay it and just don't tell him who paid it? And when he asks you, just say, Jesus paid it. So he was like, this girl's nuts. And then he says, you don't even know him. I said, well, God instructed me to. And he's like, but you don't know him. And he was, he was so shocked, but he was so blessed that he actually said to me, well, you know what? I I'm so touched by this that God would move so amazingly in a st t between two strangers that I... I'm going to give him 500 rand off when he goes for his driving lessons. You know, when you actually do the test, I'm going to knock 500 off. And, that's when, you, and this, that's when I thought, you know what? You know it's God when you give a blessing and then he just pours over it. That's, that's God working there. So, um, so anyway, he came back the next day. He was very excited. He said, well, somebody paid my debt. The driving school told me. I just pretended I didn't know who it was. He doesn't know to this day. So I really hope he doesn't watch this DVD. Um, and then about two months later, I was driving, see, I was driving again home from work, and God said to me, um, there's an old friend of yours. Um, I want you to phone him. There's a vacancy at his working place, so, and, and it's for this young boy that you helped. So I said to God, okay, I, f I said to God, but this guy doesn't know that I hear, I hear God's voice, and I haven't spoken to him in a while. He might think I'm a bit crazy. So God says, no, just phone him. The job is, this is the young boy. So I phoned my friend, explained the whole story to him, he says, send me a CV. I sent the CV through, and uh, the job was actually fitting tracking devices in cars. So when God initially showed me cars, with my natural mind, I assumed it was like selling cars in this fancy shop, but what God was actually showing me with all those cars was fitting tracking devices. So it was a job with lots of cars like the vision God showed me. 
Um, to cut a long story short, he went for the interview. Um, and this is how cool God is. There was some, somebody actually at that interview on the panel um, that he had worked with previously, that knew how well he worked. So as soon as he left that interview, they phoned him and said, the job is yours. And he still works for that company up to this day. But that's God. And, and, and what I learned from that was when God asks you to do something, shut up and do it. You've got to be obedient because you could be robbing somebody of their blessing. And that was what I would have done if I was selfish and got those boots. I would have robbed somebody, and that guy probably wouldn't have got that job. And sometimes God doesn't show us that far, but he wants to show us a little. And I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, God doesn't really test us, but I've got to be honest, in my own life, I've seen God testing me a lot. And in that situation, I feel if I, if I didn't oblige and pay that debt initially, God wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have shown me the rest you know, that he could have a job. So I also benefited from that situation because God started to talk to me more and more since I became obedient to him. The next one is God speaks to us through wise counsel, through other people. The greatest uh, example of this that we see in the Bible is God talking to us through Jesus. And then when Jesus went to be with God, then God sent us the Holy Spirit. But oftentimes, um, I don't know if you find that many times you're looking for an answer, you're going through a difficult situation, and then you get to church, the pastor's preaching, and then you feel like this message is just for you. Like everything that he's saying, the examples that he's using, whatever he's talking about, you feel like this message was just for you. And then what do you do? You go home and you think, ah, oh, what a coincidence. That's what we do. We all do it. We think, what a coincidence. And God is like looking down and thinking, wow, this is a hard nut to crack. I just, she asked for a lifeline. I gave her an answer, and now she puts it down to coincidence. So it's really easy to sometimes miss that God is talking to, to us through other people. So if we hear that message, and we know that we're going through that situation, do the same thing. If your pastor is preaching, your chances are it's God's word. So you know that message is for you. But oftentimes we can miss it because a lot of people just say, well, you know what, it's just just coincidence. And even sometimes I find even now at work when I'm telling people about the amazing thing that God's doing in other people's lives, they're like, ah, just coincidence. Okay. The next one is the vocal gifts. The vocal gifts means tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. These gifts operate through, through human vessels. So the words given must be judged by others in the church example, the spiritually mature who have wisdom and discernment and in, in, the, in the matters of spiritual things. And no word given can ever contradict the Bible. Okay, so let's just pretend. This is not an actual prophecy. I'm just using it as an example. Who's never received a prophecy before? Let me go here. God's showing me um, Albert. Okay, so Albert, this is not a true prophecy. I'm just, we play play, Okay. So God, Albert says to you, Albert, God says to you, <laughs> be cool if Albert could say to God, <laughs> give him a prophecy. Um, so God says to you, Albert, that uh, he's going to raise you up. You've been going through the season where everything's been difficult and um, the people that you've been counting on, they've just walked away from you. And God's going to raise you up so that you're going to show them exactly what God can do to your life. And God's going to cause all of them to fall at the wayside and perish. And he's going to see <laughs> and he's going to see just how, and, and these people, your friends are going to see just how good your God is. You think that's from God? No. Let's line up with the word of God. Yes, God does want to elevate his people, but God's not going to bring guilt and condemnation. He's not going to bring guilt and condemnation on somebody. And if God, it would sound more reasonable and more God-like if I said, well, Albert, God's going to bless you. And then you're going to be blessed to be a blessing. And all those friends that didn't stand by you, they're going to see God working in your life, and then they're going to be blessed by it. Now, that sounds like God, okay? So we've got to line everything up with the Word of God to make sure that what we hear is truth. Albert, if I say to you, and now this is the download from God while I was drinking this water, so this is actually what God has to say to you. If I said to you, Albert, God sees your generous heart, and he sees that in everything you do, 
that you always seek him first and you're a blessing to everyone around you. And God's going to bring in new opportunities into your situation, into your business. There's going to be new guys that join you on your team and there's going to be other opportunities and avenues that God's showing me that you're going to get into, things outside of what you are in now. And God's going to use, use you as a blessing in those areas so you can be a blessing to everyone else. I see that God has a special ministry for you, Albert, and it's um, a lot to do with people that have lost their way along the way. And God's going to use you to, to show them how real he can be to them. Does that sound like God? It does. It was just God saying that about Albert. And it sounds like God. If we take, that to, if we take it to the Bible and we test against everything in the Bible, that's how God rolls. That's how he rolls. Okay? We, can all, we all have the ability to prophesy, but we all need to grow in that area so God can use us for others. The purpose of prophecy is to edify, to exhort, and to encourage others. So you get prophets, and then you get prophetic people. The prophet is somebody that's in the office of the prophet, and his function is to go out and serve the church. Okay, And prophetic people... It's all of us who have the ability to hear God's voice. And God uses that to speak to us, to help us, uh, to encourage us, to give us guidance, to give us guidance for friends. So there's a big distinction. Not everybody who uh, can hear from God are prophets. Prophets are a function, but all of us have the ability to be, to be prophetic. And to hear God's voice uh, more and more clearly, as I said before, you just have to, just requires intimacy and obedience. And then you'll start to hear him more. Um, you know, um, prophecy in the Bible says that it's one of the gifts, and if you ask for a gift, you should ask for prophecy. Uh, Paul says it in Corinthians. And the reason he says it is because he goes on to say later on that uh, prophecy is to encourage others. And, and, and this is God's heart. You can see God's heart right there. When you prophesy and you give somebody comfort in that word or encouragement or guidance, um, God gets exalted, God gets glorified, and that person sees God more clearly. And then Paul goes on to say, he talks about tongues, and tongues is for your own edification. I'm not saying we shouldn't pray in tongues, we need to pray in tongues, but the Bible says if you ask for any spiritual gift, ask for prophecy, and the reason that you should ask for it is because it benefits others and not just yourself. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail with this because then I'll end up going over time. But the prophetic, a lot of people tend to confuse the prof uh, in the prophetic there's words of wisdom, words of knowledge, and a prophecy. So people tend to confuse the three and they say, oh, well, you know, I had a prophetic word for you, but it was actually a word of wisdom. So if I say to someone, well, if God shows me and I'm, I meet somebody and God says, well, you know, they had a really bad uh, childhood and this and this happened and it wasn't good, that was God giving me a download of a word of wisdom, something that has already happened. He's shown me that's a word of wisdom. That's not a prophecy, okay? If God says to you, well, you know what? Um, uh, God shows me this happened to this, this girl, the same situation, and he says, I, I want you to now go to your elders and tell them what happened in your, in your life, and I want you to go to this person and confront them. That is now wisdom, God giving you a word of knowledge, but also showing you what to do in the situation. When there's a word of knowledge, it's always accompanied by what to do, okay? And then a word of prophecy is most commonly something that hasn't yet happened, but God revealing it to you that it's about to happen, so you know what to expect, what to do, what not to do, okay? But there's different aspects of that, but we're not going to have time to get into that tonight. And the last one I mentioned was, he speaks to dreams and visions, my personal favorite. If you go to Acts 2.17, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see the visions. Your old men will dream dreams. So I asked God, why will the young men have visions and the old men dream dreams? That, I want to know, why did you say that, you know, like, and God said to me, well, the young men um, refers to people that are spiritually immature or spiritually young. And the old men refer to men that are, and women that are spiritually mature. So he gives the older men, the spiritually mature men, 
dreams, because dreams mostly are symbolic. So you need to have understanding of the Bible, understanding of symbols, which spiritually mature people do have. And a vision is something that appears. It's like a flash. It's so beautiful. It's um, something where you see the presence of God. And a young man that's not has good spiritual discernment will know because it's, it's just so, it's so real that you'll know that this is God in it, and you'll know God is trying to tell me something important here. Um, it has to be God. So if you don't have a discerning spiritual ear or sight, then God's going to give you a vision. But it doesn't mean if you have a vision, you're not going to get dreams. Okay? So let's just be clear on that. When it comes to dreams, um, dreams happen when you're asleep and when you cannot talk. I talk a lot during the day, so God likes to talk to me in dreams, but he also gives me visions, okay? But that's a time when your mind is resting, your body is resting, and you can't interfere with, with what God is saying to you because you're asleep. So in, if, if it's somebody who in their daily walk with God, it's not at that point yet where they know God's voice, but they have a dream, they can't interfere with what God is saying, okay? Um, and I already mentioned to you the difference between dreams and visions, but to take note that not all dreams are from God. There are some dreams that are natural dreams, and that's when there's things that are going on during the day and we, we're processing it, but we haven't settled it yet in the day, so when we go to bed, we tend to think about it. And uh, spiritual dreams, uh, we know they're from God, and they're mostly, they're either literal or symbolic. But when you have a spiritual dream, you need, you need the discernment of the Holy Spirit to know whether this is a natural dream or a spiritual dream. And as you are faithful and write your dreams down and take it to the Holy Spirit, take it to God and say, well, is this, is this just a natural dream that was on my mind or are you using what happened today to give me an answer for what I asked? Because very often that can happen. You can say, well, it's just a natural dream because this is what happened during the day. But what God is actually doing is he's using what happened. You asked a question, you said, tell me the answer. And God is talking to you at night about what to do about that situation. So then it's not a natural dream. So natural dreams and, God and dreams from God can be very confusing if you don't use the discernment of the Holy Spirit. So in everything that we do, the Holy Spirit is key, even to interpret these symbols, okay? Um, so you have literal symbols and you have um, symbolic symbols. Literal symbols will be if somebody dreams, I was going to work and I had an accident. That's it, that's a dream. That would most probably be a little dream because the probability is high, okay? That you're on your way to work and it sounds like a real dream. But just say you had a dream, you're, you're driving uh, a car, you're going, into, you're going into the woods and there's a wolf that appears to you. What are the chances you're really gonna drive into the woods and see a wolf? <laughs> the probability is low. So you can see there that that is then a symbolic dream, okay? Unless you on a camping trip and you're going to the woods. But then you'll be Albert, because Albert loves camping. <laughs> so if we had to interpret that, a car, driving the car means you in charge of a ministry. And then we said going to the woods, a woods, a woods is a place of danger, of uncertainty, and a wolf could represent the deceiver, Satan. Now how we get to those symbols is by using the Bible, again, everything falls back on the Word of God. In the Bible, there's concordances, and God tells us and explains to us what each symbol used, and those symbols has be, have been used before in other dreams. But um, I want to mention that God speaks to, uses symbols to everybody differently. He would use something like, in a lot of my dreams, it's about hair, because I'm a hairstylist, you know. If you're a farmer, God tends to use that. So somebody else interpreting your dream is not going to be as accurate as you getting, learning, equipping yourself with how to interpret your own dream and then taking it to the Bible. So if God was speaking, let me give you uh, an example. If God was speaking to somebody in India and they saw an elephant, okay, elephant to them would be transportation, because that's what elephant is used for in India. But if you're a South African and God is talking to you about an elephant, an elephant means manipulation. And if you see a car, a car would mean ministry or your life. So God speaks to us differently. So we can't really say to somebody, please interpret this dream to me, and I want all these answers, and I know what God's saying. The reason God's giving you that dream, and the reason it's symbolic, is because he wants to draw you closer. Because if every dream was literal, then you just carry on with it. You wouldn't need to seek God for answers. You wouldn't need to ponder about something, put question marks on the dream, come back to it a week later, 
and wait on God. And that's what he wants. He wants us to seek him so much so in every single thing that we do. And his intention with everything is to have that intimate relationship with us that he tended for from the beginning of time. The reason that God gives us dreams is, there's many reasons, but the most common reasons are to warn us, to inform us, and to give guidance. So the minute you get a dream and there's weird stuff happening and you feel there's danger, interpret the dream. Get help to interpret the dream. Go to the Holy Spirit. Use the concordances because there's something about to happen and God wants to warn you. And that's how much he loves us, that he's made this way available to each of us. And most people think, well, you know, I had this dream and it doesn't make sense, so it can't be from God. It's those, it's those funny ones that don't make sense that's usually from God. And if you take those funny symbols and you go to concordances, concordances and you see what it means, you'll see as you start to interpret. And this is a good way to see, is, is it from my brain making this up or is this from God? So when you have the funny symbols, you go to concordances, you see what each word means, and then you start to see how each symbol fits into the other and it starts to tell a story. And that story resonates with something that's going on in your life. And then you have that confirmation that's God. And then sometimes you may not understand what the symbol means. It may not be in the concordances. Then you're going to have to go further and look at it. Like God likes to use um, animals, you know. And not every animal might be in the Bible. So you got to say to God, well, what does that animal actually uh, represent, you know. Um, like snakes and serpents and things like that. It's common. You can find it in the Bible. Um, but there's other stuff that's not in the Bible that you have to say and you think about, well, what does it mean to me? What does that animal represent to me? And then you'll find the answer there. Because it would actually be the Holy Spirit giving you that answer. Um, so it's very important to write down our, our dreams. And if you want to hear more from God, you have to be faithful in the little things. If, you can, if you're faithful in the little, then God can trust you with more. So I'm very excited because that, the vision that God actually showed me and it's the reason why I'm standing up here today, not because I just want to give Paul a break for a change, but God showed me that what he wants for our team is that he wants us, when we go out on, on healing uh, outreaches, he wants us to see the illness that's not evident like a broken leg in the spirit. He wants me to say, oh, I see a hole in the heart because the spirit just showed you. And then go in and say, in, by his stripes you are healed and get that job done. That person then cannot just walk away and say, well, you know, he can't deny because you've now come with a, with a prophetic word or a word of wisdom and you've given that person that and you, got, and you got the job done like Jesus did. So in every single gifting, we need to grow up into the maturity and fullness of Christ so he can have full reign on us and we can be like Christ to others. And remember, sometimes when we encounter people that are not going to church, who don't have that relationship with God, we are the only example that that person might ever see of Jesus on earth. It might only be us. So it's up to us to start to grow in each gifting so that we can have the fullness of Christ. So if I had to go to that person and say, well, you have a hole in your heart and, you, and, and now you're healed, they're going to be so amazed. And if you remember a while ago, God showed me and uh, God, uh, God said to me, the laborers are few, but the harvest is plentiful. And I said to God, well, why don't you just give us more laborers? That makes so much sense. And God said, no, convert the people that you are, the harvest, and let them join this side where the laborers are. And then the harvest will be less, the laborers will be plentiful, and I will come sooner. So if you go to that word where that person say, hold in the heart, healed in Jesus' name, that person's going to be amazed by everything that God is doing. They're going to want to know more about Christ. They want to gonna come and join this team over here, the laborers. Okay? So that's God's plan and purpose for all of us. And I'm very excited about what he's going to do in this church over the next few months because um, I can see there's a lot of prophetic people over here. So before we close, let's just thank God, and then I'll hand over to Paul. Lord, we just want to give thanks to you, God, for all the ways that you've made available to us in this day and age to still fellowship with us and still talk to us, that we can still hear from you, Lord, and walk intimately with you. Um, and Lord, as each one of us just grows in this area of our lives, Lord, we ask you to allow us, Lord, to hearken to the voice of the Holy Spirit so that we can grow more and more intimately with you each day, Lord, so that you can use us 
in the same way you use Christ over this earth. We thank you, God, for your love over all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Yeah, we really want to um, <clears throat> just kind of bring out everything that God has for us within. And um, when Jesus was there, the woman at the well, she, she didn't have a crutch next to her or something, but there were some things that um, were revealed in the Spirit so that Jesus could reach her at that level and address the things that were going on in her life. And that was a sign to her. You know, these signs will follow those who believe in my name. You know, but, you know, we walk with God, right? We live in him. We move in him. And so he wants to, he's, he's talking to us. You know, I heard somebody say that our problem here is not that we don't hear from God. Uh, speaking to everybody here now, okay? Don't think, I'm not, well, I'm not talking to you. Every single one of us hears from God. The problem is um, we hear him so frequently that we don't even know and recognize that it's him. Because then we wonder, oh, is that my voice? This is my voice. You know, so, so that's where, as Amanda was saying, the intimacy with the Lord, the time we spend with him just getting quiet, we learn to recognize his voice, and, and so then we can identify, okay, that's, that's God now. So anyway, we will uh, be looking at ways to... Um, bring out this aspect and to just really so that we can all be um, just fluent in all that God has for us. So we'll, we'll be bringing out different ways and, and some, some things as well. And um, yeah, so God bless you. We love you. And we will, uh, yeah, till next time. Am I forgetting anything? Coffee. <laughs> if you like a coffee or a cup of tea, that's right. Thank you. Uh, just right there at the counter there. Stick around, hang around a little bit, and have a chat, have a cup of coffee or tea or something like that. God bless you. <laughs>